Welcome to Sheboygan County Government, working for you. My name is Adam Payne. I'm the Sheboygan County Administrative Coordinator and co-host of this program with Bill Gehring, Chairman of the County Board. And today we're pleased that our guest is Rebecca Persick, the new Family Court Commissioner. Today we want to give you a chance to meet Rebecca and learn a little bit about her roles and responsibilities. So Rebecca, why don't you start by telling our viewers a little bit about yourself and why you were interested in becoming Family Court Commissioner. Well, as far as background, Adam, I grew up in rural Manitowoc County, so I'm from the area, and uh, I went to law school in Chicago. I'm married and I have a little boy at home. I became interested in becoming a court commissioner um, because I think it's a position that you can really use to help people. And I've been, prior to becoming court commissioner, I was the assistant corporation counsel in Sheboygan County for five years. I really enjoyed that job as well, and this was really a natural extension of that, I think. Now, when people hear family court commissioner, I imagine some folks may wonder, well, well, what is that, or how is that different from a circuit court judge? Well, a court commissioner is appointed, and circuit court judges are elected. I'm appointed by the judges, and a court commissioner assumes some of the judges' duties on their behalf, and a lot of what I do are preliminary hearings on behalf of judges, and we'll get into a little bit more as we go along in our discussion exactly what those duties are. And you were appointed when? August 4th was my first day of work, so I just started this fall. And how do you like it so far? I love it. So big difference, appointed versus elected. And generally speaking, what are, what are your primary roles and responsibilities? Well, I handle a lot of preliminary uh, court matters in all sorts of cases. I handle preliminary hearings and mental commitment cases. I do initial appearances and ordinance cases and criminal cases. I set bond in criminal cases. I conduct temporary order hearings in divorce cases, and that's the first hearing that a, divorced, a divorcing couple uh, has to determine on a preliminary basis how their assets will be split up and how uh, visitation with the kids will be handled or placement with the kids will be handled. Um, I do domestic abuse and harassment injunction hearings and my office also handles all the small claims proceedings in Sheboygan County or most of them. So very important responsibilities. Obviously people are relying on you to, to make fair decisions and, and hear them out. What kind of qualifications does one have to have to become a court commissioner? Well, you have to be an attorney and you have to have several years of experience before you can become a court commissioner. Uh, you obviously have to be licensed to practice in the state of Wisconsin to be appointed in the state. Um, other than that, it's up to the judges to decide what qualifications in a person they think will best uh, fill the position. And you just shared a, a number of the activities, but if you had to sum up briefly, you know, to someone about the roles, responsibilities, the primary responsibilities of the Family Court Commissioner's Office, what would you say? The primary responsibilities are handling initial court proceedings in a lot of different cases for the judges and also um, handling mediation for the judges. How many employees do you have? Well, there are three in my department altogether, including me. Uh, there's myself, the Assistant Court Commissioner, and our Secretary, Cindy, who we could not do without. <laughs> And again, as people get a feel for your roles and responsibilities in the court system as a whole, could you just take a step back and give our viewers a, an understanding of what the court structure as a whole is like and then where you fit? Sure. It's kind, that's kind of a broad question. So if I get too broad in my answer, cut me off. But um, there are state courts and there are federal courts. And within the state court system, the lowest level of court is a municipal court and several municipalities in our county have municipal courts. I believe Elkhart Lake has one and Plymouth has one, and they hear cases that involve violations of municipal law, laws or ordinances that they the, themselves have passed. Uh, at the next level is the circuit court, and that's the level that I'm involved in. There are five circuit court judges in Sheboygan County, and then there's one court commissioner, that's me, and one assistant court commissioner. Cases that are heard at the circuit court level can be appealed to the Court of Appeals. Um, 
cases that are decided by the Court of Appeals can then be heard by the Wisconsin Supreme Court, although the Wisconsin Supreme Court does not have to take every case that's appealed to it. When someone appeals from the Court of Appeals, they file what's called a petition for review, and the Supreme Court looks that over and says, yes or no, we'll hear this case. Um, from the you, from the Wisconsin Supreme Court cases, certain types of cases can be appealed to the United States Supreme Court, and that really makes up the state court system. As far as federal courts, there are two, actually I think there are just, there are three federal courts now. One was just created up in Green Bay um, in the state of Wisconsin, and those uh, deal with federal laws or certain laws that involve crossing of state lines, such as kidnapping um, or drugs and uh, there's a federal court of appeals in the United States Supreme Court. So it kind of works the same way a state court does on a, on a larger level. So if someone was going to court, and most of us hope that doesn't happen, you know, generally it's a place we're not real interested in going to or something's happening in our life that, we're, that uh, we need that type of decision making. But if they do go to court and, and have to see the family court commissioner, what are some of the types of issues that they would have, why would they be seeing you? Well, I see a lot of people on ordinance or traffic tickets. They appear before me first, um, and I take their plea and advise them of their rights. I see a lot of divorcing couples for a temporary order. As I mentioned, they're the first people, I'm the first person they usually see to set a temporary order until their final divorce can be scheduled, which is often uh, at least four months away, sometimes frequently longer than that. Um, I see people at initial uh, mental commitment cases. I do initial appearances for juveniles, uh, juvenile ordinance violation, and children in need of protection or services cases or delinquency petitions. Um, small claims cases are handled in my courtroom as well. And some of the more fun opportunities, and maybe why you would want to go to court, would be you marry some folks as well. That's true. I also perform marriages. We book about 200 weddings a year. Very good. In the court commissioner's office. Very good. Thank you. Rebecca, you've talked a little bit about the variety of cases that you handle in your court. What do you spend most of your time on? Is there one area that you might spend most of your time on, or, or is it pretty well mixed? It's pretty well mixed. Um, one of the advantages of having a court commissioner is that my calendar is I've, I'm left quite a bit of flexible time so that people who come in who need to get into court right away, such as a divorcing couple who need a temporary order, or people who need a harassment injunction or a domestic abuse injunction can get in to see me right away. That's another difference between the court commissioner and the circuit court judges. My calendar has more flexibility to allow uh, quick services to people. Um, I think I've lost track of the, of the original question. With basically looking at the type mm. of case that you handled most often. But yeah, but there is a real mix. Sure. Uh, roughly how many cases are handled by your office in a year? It must be quite a number because of the variety of situations you've talked about. It's quite a number, and I, I took a few notes because it, you really have to break them down. As far as mental commitment cases, initial hearings that I do in mental commitment cases, there are about 200 of those a year temporary orders and divorce cases, there are about 250 a year. Uh, divorces, I also do do certain divorces, divorces that aren't contested. I do about 170 divorces a year. We do about 65 uh, harassment injunctions a year, as I mentioned, about 200 weddings a year. And the initial appearances in traffic and criminal and civil cases, I couldn't even tell you. I know yesterday I did 54 of them, mm -hmm. but there's a large number of those. Mm -hmm. With that variety of cases, which type of case is the most routine and which might be the most interesting or reward, rewarding to you? Well, I think the cases that are most routine are the initial appearances and ordinance um, cases. As far as what's most rewarding, I think the temporary order hearings I do for people who are divorcing, because oftentimes they come to me, the divorce has been filed, but they're still living in the same household, they have no decisions about who's going to take what, who's going to stay in the house, who's going to leave, when the children are going to be with each parent, and they often can't communicate well enough with each other to decide those things on their own. And they come to me, and 
I have to make a decision for them. And that's difficult to do, but it's rewarding to do because I've had some positive feedback from people who tell me that they really appreciate the way I handle the hearings. Um, they're held very informally, and I try to put people at ease because it's a very stressful time for people. And after the hearing, they can start their lives as a separated couple with some, some ground rules and some focus, which is what they need to go on with their lives. Right. You've mentioned already that you marry people. Do you marry people only in the courthouse, or can you go to the location that they might choose? Or how well, does during, that work? During business hours, I have to stay at the courthouse. <laughs> so if you want to get married between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. on a weekday, it's at the courthouse. I can perform weddings outside of the courthouse as well. Okay. And what is the charge for being married by the court commissioner? Well, currently, to be married, there is no charge. Um, starting in 2004, we are going to start charging $20 to do weddings in the courthouse. Outside of the courthouse setting, it really depends on the circumstances and how far people want me to travel or how long the ceremony is going to be. But I don't do a whole lot of those types of weddings. Okay. You talked a little bit about divorces and divorce mediation. Can you talk a little further about how you do mediate divorces? Sure. Um, Wisconsin is a state that requires divorcing couples who don't have an agreement on child custody and placement to go through mediation rather than jump directly into a contested hearing. And I think that that's a very good thing for families because before mediation was required by law, people would go into these terrible hearings where there was a lot of mudslinging, and then a decision would be made and they'd be expected to leave that hearing and parent together. Because although people are divorced, they are bound together for the rest of their lives, really, by the children they have in common. And the mediation process uh, gets two parents together with a neutral person who's trained on how to try and reach consensus between people. And the mediators, about half the time, are successful in being able to reach, help people reach agreements. And the thing that's great about mediation is a mediator does not suggest answers to people, or to people. It, the mediator helps people arrive at their own answers. And I think most people are happiest when they can make decisions on their own rather than have a court tell them what to do. And it makes sense, too, because they are in the best position to know what's best for themselves and for their children. And I think the mediation process is one of the best things to happen in the law in a long time. I think it's an important process. As far as my involvement in mediation, I'm the director of family court services. So whenever a court or one of the judges refers someone to mediation, that goes through my office, and I actually refer the couple to a specific mediator and follow up on how the mediation is going and report back to the judges with that information. Are those mediators employees of the county or your office or are they private individuals? They're in the private community? individuals and the county contracts with them to provide services. Okay. Well, you've only been on the job a short time, Rebecca. You probably have watched the court commissioner's function evolve over time. Can you talk a little bit about how the court commissioner's function and job has evolved over time? Well, um, there have been a number of changes to the court commissioner's position. I think the first one we've already talked about, which is mediation. Mm -hmm. I mean, that isn't the way the cases used to be handled, and that's been a relatively new development, legally speaking. Another change that's happened in Sheboygan County is the introduction of a lot of people from different cultures. Um, we have a lot more Hispanic people who come to court and aren't able to speak English or Hmong people. We have a lot of uh, Croatian or Serbian people in town as well. And that provides challenges because the court has to be accessible to people who speak other languages and oftentimes we have to have interpreters present. Um, and that's something that's been changing. And the other thing is an increase in pro se litigation. And pro se is, is simply a Latin term that means for self. It's people who represent themselves in court rather than hire attorneys. And pro se litigants have special challenges, I think, because there are certain procedures that have to be followed when you come to court. And people without attorneys don't always know what those procedures are. But my office is, is 
there to help people who are pro se litigants um, and we can provide information to them on how to make the court system accessible to them. Okay. You talked a little bit about the language difficulties because of Sheboygan County changing. Do you know up front that someone is not going to be able to speak English and then how do you deal with that? Might the session be adjourned until a person who can interpret can be found? or? Yes, sometimes we do know up front. For example, in criminal cases, often the officer who makes the arrest will note on the citation or the police report that the person needs an mm -hmm. interpreter. But that's not always the case. And sometimes uh, people do come to court and they can't speak English. And usually we're able to communicate well enough with them to tell them that they need to come back the following mm -hmm. day and we'll have an interpreter present. We don't provide interpreters, the county doesn't provide interpreters for all cases. We have to provide them in criminal cases um, or in mental commitment cases. In most other cases, people need to bring their own interpreters to court with them. Okay, you really sound like you enjoy your job. What is the one thing that you might enjoy most about being the family court commissioner? I really do enjoy my job and it's hard to say what I enjoy most about it. Um, I think I'd have to go back to what I talked to Adam about, which is the temporary order hearings, or maybe that was you. Uh, the temporary order hearings, I think, are very rewarding. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. So some of our viewers may recall, well, wasn't there a gentleman named Terry Burke that <laughs> used to be the family court commissioner? I, I know you two have a good rapport and, and communicate together. Mm -hmm. Where's Terry? Terry is now a circuit court judge. And he took over Judge Murphy's position when Judge Murphy retired earlier this year in July. And I have to thank Terry for the help he's given me in my position. The transition between uh, my taking over and his leaving has been very smooth because he's made himself available to me to answer questions. And I, I really have to thank him for that. So you feel as though you've gotten good support making that transition it's gone from my standpoint it seems like it's gone very very well yes I've had very good support from Terry and very good support from all the judges for that matter they've all made themselves available to me for help Bill raised some good questions about well if someone's going through a divorce and the mediation and the opportunities for assistance there if someone is going to see you because of a traffic violation or something like that what are the steps that one can expect to go through uh, do they have to stop at the clerk of court's office first before going to your department? What, what are the steps that a person generally goes through? Well, on an average traffic citation, the officer indicates right on the citation when their court date is and where they're supposed to go. And that court date is always with me, and it says room B10 in the courthouse, which is where my courtroom is located. So when someone comes to court on a traffic ticket, they come directly to my courtroom, and there are often many people there because the officers write uh, the same times on multiple citations. So you can probably expect to be sitting in a room with 50 or more people and I will come out and explain to them that they'll have two options when I call their case. They can plead guilty or not guilty and when, they, when I call their case they should come forward and have a seat at the tables that are provided. And I also explain that if they plead guilty I'll assess their penalty right away and that if they plead not guilty, they'll have a chance to come back to court to meet with the prosecuting attorney for a pretrial conference. And that's a chance for people to talk to the prosecutor and try and negotiate a settlement of their case. If that's not successful, their case will be set for a trial. And I also explain to people that if they think their case will get that far and go to a trial, they can have a jury trial if they'd like to. But if they do want a jury trial, I inform people that they have to request one within 10 days of the date they appear in, appear in front of me. And they also do have to pay a $36 fee. And they make that request in writing to the clerk of court's office and pay the fee there. That way, if their case does go to trial, they'll have a jury trial. If they don't make that request, they can still have a trial, but it would be a trial in front of a judge alone, not in front of a jury. Now, you said they can plead guilty or not guilty. Mm -hmm. Now, if they have a traffic citation, generally, if you take responsibility for it, you simply pay the fine. Do people, why would people go to court to plead guilty? Well, um, I think they come to court to plead guilty, particularly if they need a payment plan, because that's okay. something I can work out with them on how much per month they'll pay towards their citation. Very good. 
very good. So that's generally the steps involved for a citation, and you talked about the steps involved in regards to uh, someone getting a divorce and the, the, the family mediation that's available. You also have a program, uh, Remember the Children, that's, in, that's part of that process. Could you touch on that a little bit? Yes, divorcing couples who have children at home have to attend a parent education class called Remember the Children. And the class is designed to educate parents about the effects of divorce on children. Um, it's offered twice a month and it's taught by our mediators. And I recently went through four years of evaluations about that class and I was very pleased to see that the overwhelming majority of people who attend that class loved it. I had comments, I read comments such as, I didn't think I was going to like this class, I was forced to go. And it turns out it, it, it's great. I wish I could have gone sooner. And I think that's a testament both to our mediators, the, the teachers we have teaching the class, and the fact that the, the material that's gone over the class is very useful to parents. And it also allows parents who are divorcing to uh, meet other parents in the same situation and get support from them. Very good. Very good. Um, and then moving on to the other area, you said that you marry folks. If someone's interested in, in having you perform the ceremony, what steps do they have to go through to, to line that up? All they need to do is call my office, and we do weddings every Friday afternoon at the courthouse between 3 and 4. We do one every 15 minutes, and if their date is available, we can sign them up. I'll be darned. Okay. So as you've touched on, and you've covered a lot of information in, in the, the five or so minutes that we have remaining, um, as you think about the different areas, the roles, responsibilities, the clientele that you're working with, and what, what would you see is, what are the key challenges that you face? Um, I think the key challenges are things I already touched on, which are pro se litigants, uh, people who don't have representation, who need, who need help in the court system, and the, need, the growing need for interpreters in the court system. And what do you think we do about it, too? to address that challenge? Well, um, it's funny that you should ask that, Adam, because we're in the process, I hope, of developing and putting on our county website some information for pro se litigants that will enable them to navigate the court system much more easily. And even if people don't have a computer at home, there are computers available at the county or at the public library that people can use, and I think that will be a big help and that I hope to have up and running before the end of the year. Excellent. Um, as far as the need for interpreters, that's something that I think we just continue to handle on a day-to-day -day basis as needed. And as the need for interpreters grows, we have a couple of interpreters who I see regularly in the courtroom, and they've been fantastic. We had a situation once where someone came in, he, uh, we weren't able to communicate any information to him at all, and I was able to contact one of the interpreters at her home number, and she agreed to interpret over the phone for that individual. So you kind of have to fly by the seat of your pants sometimes. Um, but so far, I think we've been doing a pretty good job of meeting the needs of the people who come to court. Very good. So if any of our viewers or anyone else uh, at any point has a question or a concern or a complaint, who do they call? Well, if they have a complaint or a concern or a question, I hope they call my office directly first. If they feel they can't get any help there, I'm supervised by you, Adam. They can contact you. I'm supervised by the county board and also by the circuit court judges. That's a lot of supervisors. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been a pleasure to have you with us today. And I know that Bill and I are, are very pleased with the job you're doing. And we've heard nothing but good things from the judges and others. And, and certainly, it's good that you and Terry Burke have a nice rapport and that there's been a smooth transition. So thank you for joining us today. Oh, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Next month, we're going to bring back a department head that I know you've heard from before, Mr. Dale Pauls. As you know, there's been a great deal of discussion in the county about the future of our county nursing homes, uh, both Sunny Ridge and Rocky Knoll, and there have been a lot of improvements made out there. If you haven't had an opportunity to, to go to one of those facilities, I certainly encourage you to do so. Rocky Knoll, recently the county board put a $10 million addition out there, and it's providing a very valuable service. It's a beautiful facility. In Sunny Ridge, a number of upgrades were made. 
But with that said, uh, we're, we're really struggling as a county dealing with the, the financial constraints and frankly the lack of revenue from the state and federal level. Uh, for 2004 alone, we're looking at about a $2.7 million reduction. And just this week, depending on when you watch this program, uh, the county board reviewed the budget and, and made some very important decisions and we'll be finding, uh, finalizing that shortly. But Dale Pauls will be with us for the next program to talk about the Health Care Center Citizens Task Force, a very important committee that County Board Chairman Bill Gehring has appointed, will be confirmed by the full county board, and we're optimistic that this group of citizens, as well as three county board supervisors, will take a look at our overall mission, roles, responsibilities, uh, the financial constraints and challenges that we have, as well as the escalating costs associated with the taxpayer and, and the property tax levied for those nursing homes. Look at all of that and develop recommendations for the county board to consider about where we're headed. So we're, we're looking forward to Dale coming in and uh, talking with us a little bit about the charge of that task force and where we're headed. So until then, on behalf of the Sheboygan County Board, Chairman Bill Gehring, it certainly was a pleasure to have you with us today and, and thanks again Rebecca for joining us. found anywhere. The people who manufacture methamphetamine aren't chemists and it's a very dangerous process. It's toxic, it's poisonous, it's flammable, it's explosive. What we as citizens can do in our community to stop the flow of methamphetamine is educate ourselves in what's going on, to be aware of what's happening in our neighborhoods and report suspicious activity to the police department. You know, it doesn't even matter what I think or what I believe, you can't be heard. The whole system, it's rigged from top to bottom. An honest voice in politics? There's no chance of that. At least that's what I used to think about politics. I can make a difference. The system works best when we're all involved. The Youth Leadership Initiative prepares young men and women for their roles as American citizens. Pairing technology with education, the Youth Leadership Initiative captures the attention of our nation's youngest citizens and leads them into the democratic process. Together with local schools, YLI offers internet-based projects that complement classroom instruction and foster long-term participation. I'm a member of my community. I'm a parent and a grandmother. How can we help? Bring the free civic education resources of the Youth Leadership Initiative to your schools today. Call now for a free information packet and to receive this Presidents of Our Country ruler. Together, we can pass the torch to the next generation. This is not a race. On the road to financial independence, the winners are the ones who stay the course. Learn more about securing your financial future and choose to save it will pay off in the long run. There's a new experience around every corner as you discover Wisconsin. Discover Wisconsin like you've never seen before.